Hello, and welcome to the last podcast in our Archetypes series. These are some patterns that we see universally in literature that we really couldn't classify with some of the others, such as numbers, colors, weather, etc. So we kind of just lump them all together in this last one. But just because they are randomly lumped together does not mean that they are any less or more important than some of the others. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. Again, the idea of an archetype is out of a universal symbol that seems to cross literature and texts, both time, culture, and genre, that we tend to see these throughout all stories around the world, regardless of when they were written or where they were written. So what's cool about archetypes is that you could be reading something from Asia, something from Africa, something from North America, and you may be seeing the same reliance on the same symbols throughout. So here's some examples. So the first one of these archetypes that we wanted to look at here is the idea of the desert. Throughout texts, many times when they are set in deserts, it's a pretty hopeless and death-filled experience. And so you can see some examples, bottom right, Lawrence of Arabia. Upper right, we see Mad Max, where Mad Max has been banished from the civilization that he's living in, and so their form of punishment was to send him out into the desert. And then on the left-hand side, we see the classic Hangover series. Again, much of that takes place in Las Vegas. Why not set something that is full of hopelessness and tomfoolery in the desert? Of course, it makes sense because the desert is a symbol of hopelessness and not good things. Again, you could connect it to the Christian imagery story of Jesus roaming the desert for 40 days. He doesn't get to roam in a lush garden with all kinds of things at his fingertips to help him stay alive. No, he's roaming a desert. Another example of one of these universal archetypes is the idea of the fish or of fishing. And so oftentimes this gets used as a symbol of divine creation. So you may see people with the little fish on the back of their car. They're supposed to symbolize the creation, creationism story, the idea that God created the world in six days kind of thing. At the same time, fish often represent life because they represent food. And traditionally, this is how many people stayed alive, especially those on the coast. They weren't able to farm, but they stayed alive by getting the fish from the ocean. And so we see overlaps in literature and again across time and culture. So we have this story in the top of Moby Dick. Yes, the whale is not a fish. We get that. This is a mammal and not a fish. But it still represents the idea of here's some sort of grand creation, grand creature that is causing this great struggle for this person, Ahab. It is his life struggle to conquer this white whale. And so that kind of goes back to that archetype of fish equaling life. And very similarly down the bottom right, Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea, the idea of the grand fish that is out there. And so we see overlaps throughout time and culture where fish tend to stand for life. Another archetype we might notice is the idea of a garden this idea that you have some sort of unspoiled beauty, very small, confined, paradise on earth kind of thing. And so we can see this in many different texts. So in Christian imagery tales, we may have the idea of the garden being descended from the Garden of Eden, where everything was allegedly perfect until someone ate an apple and the snake and all that stuff. But we can also see in other texts from around cultures, when characters are in a garden, it is supposed to be this idea of paradise, a safety zone, a place where nothing can harm them. And so we can see some overlap with the secret garden, the book. We also see examples from even Lord of the Flies, the story where all of the boys were stranded on the island. They pretty soon fall into death and destruction and bad things like that. But one of the characters named Simon often retreats from that and secludes himself in this area that Golding describes as very much a garden-like place. Amidst all the death and decay and destruction that all the other boys are committing, Simon is able to retreat into this garden. Again, a symbol of paradise, a symbol of safety. Now, the garden is going to be different than the woods. I think oftentimes when we envision the archetypal garden, we envision lush things growing, a lot of flowers, a lot of beautiful vines, maybe some fruit trees, but nothing really scary. The overall feeling of the garden is light and happy and hopeful. 
This is going to be in contrast with the idea of the woods. And so we get this definite change in mood if we see something moving from a garden to the woods or a character entering the woods. It seems to be a continual archetypal warning. Something dangerous is happening once you enter the woods. And you can see that reinforced in many different texts. Little Red Riding Hood. Things are going fine until she needs to get into the woods to deliver the goods to grandma's house. That's where the wolf comes out and gets her. We could have the Sleeping Beauty story where when things go bad and they need to hide Aurora from the evil Queen Maleficent, the evil fairy Maleficent, they take her to the woods, get her out of sight, get her away from everything. We get the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village. Again, bad things happen in the woods. We have from Harry Potter, The Forbidden Forest. We have the yellow brick road going into the woods of the Wizard of Oz. And so the characters of Dorothy and the Scarecrow and the Tin Man need to travel through the woods, and that's where they face all of their challenges. It's not in the beginning when they land in Munchkinland. That's where everything's great, everything's positive, happy. But as soon as they start on that journey, that journey takes them into the woods, and there is a change in feeling and mood. And then we have The Princess Bride, where Wesley the pirate has rescued Princess Buttercup, and he's taking her into the fire swamp. Yes, they call it a swamp, but in effect, it is a woods. And throughout that time, they have to face great challenges like the quicksand, like the fires that pop out, and of course, the R-O-U-S's, the rodents of unusual size. So as you are reading, pay attention to the narration, pay attention to the setting. If we see characters being in the woods or going into the woods, this is probably a universal symbol that bad is going to happen. Another archetypal idea that we'll look at is the idea of an old man. And by old man, we also mean old woman. In effect, what we're getting at is that in most stories and texts from around the world, again, across culture, across time, across genre, we're going to have some sort of a mentor figure that gives advice to the protagonist or the hero of the story. So while we say old man, we certainly do not mean that women cannot fill this role as characters because they certainly do. Basically, it's the old wise guy or old wise girl idea. This seems to pervade texts throughout the world. So for example, we could certainly have Yoda, Obi-Wan, Dumbledore, Gandalf. We could have Glinda the Good Witch. We could have the dude from Dodgeball, Molly Brown from Titanic, the old car from Cars. So we have all kinds of different incarnations of this role. But in short, we need to see archetypally some sort of mentor figure that guides the protagonist on his or her hero's journey. And so, of course, these could be men, they could be women, they could be other creations or figures. But they represent wisdom. They've been on this trail before. They have accomplished something and they're trying to pass that on to somebody who's new. They definitely serve as a mentor. A couple more here. Another example is the idea of the serpent. And the serpent tends to stand for evil, badness, corruption, things like that. In Christian lore, we see the serpent most predominantly in the Garden of Eden story. Again, the garden, the archetype of everything going well, safety, security, is then ruined by the archetype of evil, which is the snake who comes along to say, hey, you should try this fruit. Another biblical story, Jesus visited by the devil as a snake. And then connect that to more current contemporary literature, the idea of Voldemort in Harry Potter. He's exceptionally snake-like in everything about him. He looks like a snake. He has a snake as a sidekick. And also he's able to speak parcel tongue, so he can speak to snakes. So every clue that J.K. Rowling gives us is archetypal about Voldemort. Dresses in black, seems like a snake, not a great guy first meet him in the Forbidden Forest in the first book. So everything about the usage of archetypes points that this character is bad. But throughout, the most predominant one is the idea that he's very snake-like. And throughout literature, snakes tend to be bad. Another one here is the idea and the archetype of water. Water plays some interesting and perhaps conflicting roles because it serves on one end to be the idea of purification that water can make things clean, that can cleanse away sin in the archetypal idea of baptism. But at the same time, it can also serve as death. 
as in flash flooding or just the typical Noah flood that happens and we see that killing off all the bad things in a story and then after that we get water creating rebirth. So again, archetypally, we're going to see water serve this very cyclical role. On one hand, destroy a lot of stuff and be very, very negative, but then it can also be seen as a life-giving purification symbol. But again, what's cool is that we're going to see this as an archetype across time, across culture. We see in creation myths from around the world, from times that predate the Bible, Mesopotamia, ancient Japan, ancient China, many of them include the idea of water that had somehow cleansed the earth and helped begin it anew in the culture that they were writing from. So again, not just a Western literature piece. This is archetypal, and we can see it around the world across time, culture, and genre. One more archetype here is the idea of the apple. Just a simple fruit could be of any color, but many of the apples that we tend to see in literature tend to be the very tempting and red apple. So we get that overlap with the archetypal color of red that oftentimes seems to be that of passion, of love, of romance, of burning, of temptation in general. But the apple itself seems to be archetypally a symbol for temptation and usually seems to be a bad thing. Whether it's from the Christian story of the, the Garden of Eden, where the snake uses the fruit to tempt Adam and Eve, Many times authors and artists interpret that to be an apple. The cover of the Twilight series has an apple. A very fun scene from Pleasantville in the bottom right, where Tobey Maguire's character is still stuck in black and white, and he's trying to figure out who he is. And he takes a date to this garden, Unspoiled Beauty, and while they're there, she says, look at all this great color that we can see. And she shows him some blueberries, and they're blue, even though, even though everything else is in black and white. And then at some point, she reaches up and plucks something from a tree, and almost like archetypal clockwork, what she pulls down is a red apple and in this scene she's handing it to him trying to encourage him to taste this colorful apple and break from his black and white world we can see the apple in snow white and the seven dwarfs this is what the queen disguised as the old hag uses to tempt snow white she gives her the wishing apple we can see it in the kind of parody of the princess tales movie enchanted again where the evil character uses an apple to tempt the more positive happy naive character Additionally, we have from Greek mythology the use of the apple in the story where they were to determine who was the most beautiful. Three Greek goddesses were fighting over who was the most beautiful, and at some point, I think it's Hera, gives Paris the apple and says, here, you should decide who's the most beautiful. But what does she hand him kind of as a bribe? An apple. So that's about it in terms of this podcast. Again, some kind of random archetypes that didn't fit into numbers, colors, weather, etc. We just wanted to make sure you guys saw these. So as we are reading through our pieces of literature or di viewing different texts, look for these patterns. It's not just that this one text uses the apple to show temptation. We can see that across time, culture, and genre. We see it over and over again. And so whether it's the snake, the garden, the fish, the desert, the apple, these are all archetypes. They are very important, satisfying, universal symbols that appeal to readers' background knowledge, that we understand where they're coming from, how they work, and they help shape the current text that they're in. So as always, if you have any further questions, please bring those into class. We'll help get those straightened out. Otherwise, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you soon.